Welcome to the first time ever live with Lim Tian and Han Hui Hui. Hey, hi everyone. Hello everyone. We are Good afternoon. Here today because of the letters that is being sent by the AGC where our taxpayers money are being wasted by the Singapore government once again. So, any question? <laughs> Anything we should talk about? So the main purpose of today is that we are going to get funds from the public if the public is going to contribute and this is the bank account and this is the specific bank account that the Singapore government, the Singapore AGC is targeting right now. So the AGC wants me to declare my asset and I'm a Singaporean mother, I have three kids. All Singaporean child have three bank accounts. They have one CDA account, they have one personal account under the parent's name and another account with the, with the parents, it's a joint parent-child account. So that is three accounts and for each child you have three accounts. You have three children, you have nine accounts that you need to declare if I were to go to court. And that is what the AGC wants me to declare. But this CDA is actually the future CPF account. So in Singapore, the government say that, okay, I'm going to give you money for giving birth. And this money will go into your CDA account. But this CDA account will later on transfer into a secondary account, then transfer into your CPF. So this CDA account actually shares 2.5% interest, which is the same as your CPF account. So this is how the Singapore government claims that they are giving money into children's bank account, but actually this account doesn't go directly to the children. The children can't withdraw it as cash. The children will end up with having this money being locked up in their CPF. And why is it being locked up in their CPF? Because our basic healthcare sum right now is at $66,000. And then we also have a CPF retirement sum. So when you add both of them together, it's $247,000 for Singaporeans right now. So for my children, it's going to be probably a million dollars by the time you keep increasing in this manner. Yeah. So if we, you ask people to give you money, uh, yo, we need to know more about you at Lim Tian now. So let me move to Lim Tian. Lim Tian, you are fondly known as Singapore's most feared politician. <laughs> Thank now, why, you. Why do you think uh, people uh, call you Singapore's most feared politician? Well, that's a good question. I think it is because I am quite fearless in voicing out my opinions. I, I don't hold back. I have thought that if you want to be a good opposition, you must be fearless in voicing out um, what you think uh, is wrong with the system. And very often you think that, you, you see that actually your voice represents a great number of people in the country. The problem is, I think a lot of politicians in our country try to play safe. They try to steer the middle course. They think that, well, I must be gentle or conciliatory you know, so that Singaporeans don't have a negative image of me. And I think that is the wrong attitude, all right? Then I don't think that you are really performing your job as an oppos opposition politician. But I am very glad to be here today because um, we are here for an important purpose. Han Hui Hui is someone I respect tremendously. Do you know that she is known as Singapore's champion of freedom, okay? She was a resident fellow at York University in England for eight months. And I understand that at recent human rights event organized internationally, she was the only Singapore representative that was picked. So I think it speaks volumes about her courage in trying to create a better society for Singapore. But I will always be um, very proud of what she did in this judicial review challenge that was taken out in December last year. So it's almost a year now. That judicial review challenge was issued on the 28th of December, 2021. It was heard 
in the first half of this year and unfortunately the judge of the High Court dismissed the application. But I think this is an important process. It is an important evolutionary process for Singapore because what Hui Hui and five other courageous Singaporeans did was to challenge what they regarded as unfair policies by this government. The first one being that those who were not vaccinated would have to bear their own medical bills if they fell ill. Now, this was a complete reversal of what the government told the Singaporeans in 2020. That if you fall ill, the government will foot the medical bill. Now, I pause that. You know, I myself, I'm vaccinated. But certain people refuse to. Like Han Hui Hui. And many Singaporeans. And they are not odd. Even in China, a large percentage of their elderly refuse to be vaccinated. And people have good cause for concern. Because to many, the vaccine that was introduced was an experimental vaccine. All right? And in fact now, there is a big scandal going on in the European Parliament about Pfizer's testimony before the European Parliament. All right? Where some say there are conflicting accounts here that the Pfizer spokesperson, spokeswoman, admitted that they did not test for the vaccine's effectiveness on transmission. And MOH, when they resisted our application, was saying, oh no, you know, the vaccine will prevent transmission or help prevent transmission. Now, who's to believe what? All right? Who's to believe what? And then, so that was the first point we challenged. And the second point Hui Hui and the five others challenged was this. You will recall that the government then passed, well, there's a debate here. In court, they said that it was just an advice. All right? We said that it was something more than an advice. All right? Because what they said was that employers could terminate their employees if their employees were not vaccinated. And so employees, by the beginning of this year, I believe it was the 1st of January, faced the prospect of not being able to go back to their workplace. And we said that was discriminatory. We said that was, that violated the Constitution. Again, we were not successful on that argument. But, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, in a civilized society, people can have differing points of view. And we must respect that. It cannot be that if one group of people hold a certain view, and it is not a crazy view by, by any means, and they decide to challenge in court, that ultimately they have to bear this tremendous consequence. And you heard from Hui Hui, right? Now the Attorney General is pursuing her to pay up $22,000 in costs. Now, in court, I tried to argue that this was a matter of public interest and there should be no cost. But the court did not accept that argument. The court awarded 20000 to the Attorney General. And mind you, 
This is a public institution funded by taxpayers' money. All the lawyers, and it resembles a giant law firm, all the lawyers in the AGC are paid with taxpayers' money. And they were still seeking $20,000 in costs from the six applicants. And when you add another $2,000 of disbursements, what they say were expenses they incurred, the bill comes up to $22,000 or $22,500 thereabouts, I think. So, I am appealing to you today. And you know what is striking? Is that they have made a beeline for Han Hui Hui. Alright? They have, they have not gone to the other five to say you are equally responsible for the fees. They have targeted Han Hui Hui. They issued what was known as an EJD, an Examination of Judgment Debtor. And she was supposed to have appeared in court on the 12th of December, but I think that was postponed. But ultimately, I understand from Hui Hui that she has been given one month to pay up if they are not going to pursue this matter any further. And you have heard from Hui Hui, she has just given birth. She's the mother of three beautiful children, one who's a baby sitting right next to me now. And um, $22,000, my friends, is a lot of money. Is a lot of money for the great majority of Singaporeans. And I hope you will be generous. You were incredibly generous when you opened up your wallets and you contributed so generously to Leong Zihian when we crowdfunded for his costs and damages in the defamation suit brought by Lee Sien Lo. You were so generous when we crowdfunded for Terry Su, who was also sued by Lee Sien Lo for defamation. We, I think, collected over 300 over 1,000. And on top of that, it was not just Leong Zihian or Terry Su who benefited from your generosity. Who else generated, who else benefited? Roy Neng, who was sued by the Prime Minister, I believe in 2014 or 2015, and who had paid a fraction of what he was adjudged to owe the Prime Minister. But after Zihian's crowdfunding was so successful, Roy Neng started his own crowdfunding. I think he still owed the Prime Minister something to the tune of 140000 or thereabouts. And he crowdfunded the sum within a week, to the best of my recollection. So I am appealing to you, my fellow Singaporeans, to be generous, to recognize the sacrifice and the courage of Hui Hui and the five other Singaporeans in this matter. At least we have had someone to come out to challenge the government policy. Now, at the end of the day, the court has ruled against Han Kui Kui and the five others. We accept that. We respect that. But that is what is supposed to happen in a civilized society, where people can have differing opinions and we let the court decide. But in this matter, I think it is an issue of public importance. It is an issue of public importance not only to Singapore, but it has gone worldwide. Everywhere in the world now, whether it is in America, it is in Australia, it is in New Zealand, people are suing the authorities, suing the pharmaceutical companies for vaccine injury. Let me give you the latest example. Yesterday, the Thai princess, who is the next in line to the throne, collapsed when she was out running. A very healthy young lady of 44 years old, very well educated, a fitness fanatic. She was out running the dogs in the national park, Kauiai, and she collapsed for no apparent reason. And you find that this phenomenon is repeating itself worldwide. A lot of very fit athletes die suddenly, mysteriously. 
at the beginning of the pandemic, not at the beginning, maybe somewhere in the middle, when the vaccines were introduced, do you know who was one of the most famous athletes who died? Mysteriously, Marvin Hagler, the greatest middleweight champion of all time, boxer. All right? He, he, he died for no cause or reason. And it was all hush-hush. But, you know, people put two and two together and people can come to a, 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 a summation. All right? Why would a 44-year-old healthy Thai princess who has the best medical care in the world suddenly collapse? Yes, she was vaccinated. Yeah? So, my friends, let me say this. Governments may use the force of law to try and clamp down on discussion, on dissent. They will succeed initially, they will succeed to a certain extent, but I am almost sure, I am almost sure, this thing is going to blow up into the biggest scandal this century and of our generation. And we have hardly seen the beginning of it yet, from what I read from the reports. All right? I am not pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. I have told you, I myself, I am vaccinated. I took the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac. I went for my booster shot in December last year. But after I got my booster shot, I got COVID in February of this year. All right? Now, I don't intend to have any more vac vac uh, jabs, all right? I have, I have read enough and I have heard enough. I will stop here. I hope I have said enough. And I appeal to you to support this mother of three and to help us raise this sum of 22000 today. Thank you very much. And we we. You were breastfeeding your baby in front of the camera. <laughs> so luckily there was nothing to see. <laughs> now, Henry we our total fertility rate TFR, I understand is like the second lowest in the world. How did you manage to have three babies in four years while you were a human rights fellow in residence for eight months at the University of York Center for Applied Human Rights in the United Kingdom? How do you manage that? Your husband forced you or you forced him? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, because when I was a... I started blogging in 2007. So I always say that I just want to be a mother. And all these all this politics things, because in Singapore, people say that politics are all just guys. And I didn't know until when I really... And I wasn't really involved. I just do blogging and I just talk about government policies. Because it affects everyone's life. But a lot of people say, oh, you better go to Jackson Don't talk to me about politics. But the thing is, if you go out, you buy chicken rice, then you have to pay money, they pay their rent, and they pay the GST. These are all politics. And these are all policies that affect our life. Yeah, it's like I go to hospital, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether it's restructured, these are all government policies. So I say that. Okay, all these things are important. But also, at the same time, I mentioned before, I want to give birth to four kids. So I have three. I still got one more to go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I want four kids before 30 years old. I think I wrote it when I was a teenager. And straight Times, all the newspaper, they reported on it. So I wanted to get married at 21. Have my four kids 23, 25, 27, 29. So before 40, I'll finish my four kids. So I haven't hit my target yet. But you, you know why people are very busy in Singapore and they are not giving birth? Because they are busy earning money to reach the $247,000 in their CPF. This is why people are not giving birth. And housing are so expensive. So people cannot find a place to you know, do it. You can ask your husband come show his face or not. We need to... Uh, <laughs> hello, hello? They are outside. Huh? They are outside. The oh, three boys are outside. Away, really? can, I, can I chime in here to say something about the TFR, which is a subject that is very close to my heart. Alright? Now, 
my friends, we have a serious, serious problem in this country. You know, a good friend of mine showed me a set of statistics some time ago. In 1990, so 32 years ago, the percentage of foreigners, foreign-born person that made up our population, all right, was 24%. 24%. Okay? Bear that figure in mind. In 2020, that figure had gone up to 43%. That means a relative increase of 19% in 30 years, in three decades. And when you have a TFR of 1.12, which is one of the lowest in the world, I think South Korea is lower, maybe Taiwan is lower, we may be the third lowest. All right. What does that mean? Singaporeans are not reprodu not even reproducing themselves. Okay, not even reproducing themselves. And yet, year on year, you hear that our population is increasing, right? Wow. Suddenly the BTO prices are so expensive. You know? You have to wait what five, six years for a BTO. Now where has that population come from? Of course, it is the influx, it is the immigration. Yeah? And my colleague, Yong Zihian, told me a startling set of statistics only two days ago. At the beginning of the pandemic, our population went down from, I think, 5.8 to about 5.4 million. It is now back up to the pre-COVID level of 5.8, all right? And listen to this. He did some maths. Of course, the figures are very opaque, all right? The figures are very opaque. And you have to be a statistician like Long Zihi and to be able to work out the figures. Do you know that today, the workforce in Singapore, if you include the PRs, and the foreigners. If you just take the sorry, if you just take the PRs and the foreigners, they constitute about forty-eight percent, forty-eight percent of our workforce. Now, if you include the new citizens, and of course, you know many immigrants over the years have become Singaporeans, right? The figure is a staggering about 55 percent that means half the workforce in singapore more than half 55 percent of the workforce in singapore are not local born now my friends it is very well for the pap to keep telling us every day how wonderful foreigners and foreign talent are all right i have never bought that story i have never bought that story and I have never bought their story that these foreigners and foreign talent bring more jobs to Singaporeans. And I can tell you a simple reason. I don't have to rely on statistics or numbers. I live the life of, a, of an ordinary Singaporean. And I tell you something. In the last one week, I have noticed that the taxi drivers who drive me have become younger and better educated. You know, in 2015, in the general election televised debate, I made a statement that Singapore has the best educated taxi drivers in the world. And that is true. It has even become more true today. I was astounded when two days ago, I was in a taxi the taxi driver could not have been more than 42 to 43 years old. I'm telling you, he spoke immaculate, impeccable English with an Oxford accent. Or some of you would even say with a Queen's accent or Queen's English. Now, 
what does that show you? It shows you that this person is a very educated person, must have worked in a very good company, probably an international company, but got retrenched, right? And that's why now he's having to drive a taxi. Alright? And Zhi Hien told me something recently as well. You know recently the MOM published the figures, the labor figures for the third quarter. They have not published for the second and the first yet. And why? Why not? But they published the figures for the third quarter of this year. 94% of job growth went to foreigners. That means what? 6% for Singaporeans. For locals, they say. And locals include PRs, eh? I mean, that is the type of... They, they, they bare face dare to tell Singaporeans foreign talent creates more jobs for Singaporeans. You are not going to fool me when I look at the figures and 94% of the new jobs are going to foreigners. Yeah? I have said this in many forums. I don't care if you call me a racist or, or, or xenophobic. I am not. I have lived in many countries around the world. All right. I have lived for long periods in England, in Indonesia, and other parts of the world. I have great friends from all parts of the world. I'm not racist or xenophobic. But when I speak up for Singaporeans' interests, don't come and tell me I'm racist and xenophobic. All right. You know, when Germany, during Angela Merkel's time, admitted more than 1 million immigrants because of the Syrian war. The German people went up in arms because no right-thinking person, all right, no right-thinking person will think it is right for that many foreigners to come into their country in a short span of time. And of course, the authorities and those pro immigration, pro-open borders, all right, say, oh, you're racist and you're xenophobic. No, it is not a matter of racism and xenophobia because this is the talk from the global elites, the people who stand to gain the most, to profit the most from open borders and immigration, from labor arbitrage. They take labor from a cheap country, they import it into their own country, or it can be foreigners importing the labor into another country. They profit by it, but the people who suffer are the locals. Yeah? The people who suffer are the ones like that taxi driver who spoke Queen's English. And you tell me that it is his lot as a Singaporean to be driving a taxi at this stage of his life. And you say that this is good for Singapore. So, my friends, our TFR is disastrous. All right? It is exacerbated all the time with ridiculous policies. And one of the ridiculous policies now, which people are seeing through, is HDB. 60% of Singaporeans think that property is unaffordable now. Now, I don't need to go and listen to a sim and or whatever, all right? Come up with fancy arguments and all that. And I think the opposition is also taking the wrong tack. They are making the arguments so complicated. It is a result of flawed PAP policies of the last 30 years. Building land costs into HDB, all right? And now, of course, they can't get out. And that's why Sim An has to go and say, oh, you know, if you, if you lower HDB prices drastically, many Singaporeans will be hurt. Yes, it is because of your flawed policies. All right? And now, on the resale market, I think it was in October, 
it could have been October or November, there were 45 transactions over a million dollars. And they say, oh, but BTO is different, it's affordable. Yeah, it is affordable, really? When people have to pay over 25, 30 years? And you know something? When a couple has to wait five to six years for a BTO, what happens? They move together, they move in together as a family unit later in life, don't they? That means they will have children later in life, right? No one is as brave as a Han Hui Hui who has told you that before 30 she wants to have four children. Because a lot of Singaporeans will be doing their sums and thinking, look here, I can't afford this. It's not only housing. It's not only the rising inflation on food and fuel. What about childcare? What about other costs? You know, if we are such a rich nation, I say this, our most important task, and I have said this many times before, is to raise our TFR to well above two. We are a long way away from that. But it can be done. It doesn't mean that every advanced country has to have such a poor TFR. I give you a good example. A great example is Australia, where there has been a baby boom in recent years. Why? Because they have very good government policies that encourage family building. On the other hand, the PAP, Indrani Raja, comes out once in a while and tells you, oh, we've got all these policies to help Singapore families have more children. Year after year, decade after decade, the TFR keeps going down. And you, it's not rocket science, right? Straight away you can tell. It is because of a failure of government policies. All right? That's what I have to say about TFR, we agree. But my friends, I hope you don't forget the number behind and please contribute generously to Hui Hui's legal fund. Okay? And we we four children. How do you manage to get three babies in four years? <laughs> Share your <laughs> secret with Singaporeans so that the government can learn from you and try to lift the, uh, you know, uh, TFR. I think the main thing, no, first of all, I think one thing very important from his speech that I want to add is that the median age of first time mother in Singapore is actually 31 years old. So when I go out, I will be younger than half the mothers out there every time I bring my children out. And that is for first time mothers. So first time mother is 31. So those family whereby they have more than one kid, right? That, fa that parents is like, some of them almost 40. Then there are also, in the news we see celebrity giving birth at 50 years old. So that is actually a very sad thing because when you are older, your sperm quality drop. Then when your sperm quality drop, that's when you have children with issues. Which also explains why nowadays, I think it was also public in the news, they say that Singapore happened to have a lot of kids with a lot of different kinds of allergies. And this kind of things happen is because the parents are old. So when the parents are old, the children that they produce are of a lower quality. Yeah, and Lee Kuan Yew is like, you know, he, he believes in eugenics, so yeah, that explains a lot of the situation. On, and the government is, is the one who say that, oh, you know, Singaporeans are the one who don't have initiative, their brain cannot think better than foreigners, that's why foreigners can be there to steal your lunches. So the reason why people have the ability to take away things from Singaporeans is because Singaporeans let them take away it in the first place. If the government tells you to stop at 2, you say, no, I'm not going to stop at 2. If I stop at 2, then you are going to ask the foreigners to come in. Then, th then the thing is, Singaporeans keep re reproducing, and foreigners won't come in in the first place. And if foreigners are here to come in, we are not saying that, okay, foreigners cannot come in. And the, in fact, the foreigners come in, they have to be separated from their families in their own country as well. And even those who come in successfully, how come there are so many PRs and so many people holding work passes, it's because maybe they have one family who is in the family tree. There is only one person who is a doctor. And that person happened to become a Singaporean. But the spouse of the, of 
this person, the children of this person, the parents that they try to bring over, they only can become PRs, they only can hold work classes, which explains why there is such a large number of uh, holding all these classes. And how do I know? Because I bring my children to, to see doctors, and, I, and the doctors always tell me, Oh, you know y'all are very lucky, you're a whole family Singaporeans, right? So y'all get the subsidized rate. My family, right, we also pregnant, eh? but then we have to pay PR rate. Then I was like, I thought you are Singaporeans, eh? Yeah, but my spouse cannot become a uh, Singaporean. So there are a lot of these kind of families you need in Singapore, right? but one person is a Singaporean. Which, if you look at the BTO now, because at my housing estate, we live in BTO. And in BTO, we realize that how come there are so many foreigners here? Yeah, because they speak to us in not Singlish, not English. Yeah, that's how we know. Then we start to realize you only need one Singaporean to get a BTO. Compared to last time, I think last time there was like you need both to be Singaporean to get a BTO. Then now you only need one. So we realize there are a lot of people whereby the whole family, there's only one Singaporean. And from that one Singaporean, they get the whole family here. Yeah, and these people also have to suffer under the government policies. Which is why we need everybody to go and vote wisely to a government who won't go and you know, create policies that harm Singaporeans in the long run. And that there are people who there are people who ask, okay, uh, so you have three kids, then how do you raise three kids? I, I also realized this issue is that if you have three kids and you need to send them to preschool in Singapore, then why is the government not building enough preschool? And if you realize a lot of preschool in Singapore is called Sparkle Talk. And Sparkle Talk has this PAP logo inside. It's actually under PCF, which is PAP Community Foundation. So why is it that money are big? Because the government always say we are helping preschool, uh, preschool operators. But these preschool operators are known as PCF, which is helping the PAP. So why don't they have opposition community foundation? Then the opposition are the one collecting this money and opposition can create their own kind of childcare. Or why is there not an issue such as totally the government, the totally the PAP and the opposition, they don't have this kind of community foundation whereby they create this kind of anchor childcare cooperator. Instead, all of them are taken in by the MOE government. Because the government should be the one taking care of the children. Not the government give money to anchor operator. Because by giving money to anchor operator, they are using this to legally transfer the money to the PAP. Very good, Anwiwi. Now, your husband is Singaporean, right? Because a lot of people say he looks Japanese. Eh? <laughs> oh, because they went and they anyhow put. Oh, there are some people who say that my three children look different. They look like from different fathers. And I leave those comments there because I take joy in this kind of comment. Because if all three children look different, there's a chance one of them look like me. <laughs> oh, no you chance, can, you I can look say like you, right? your three children all look so alike. All right, I do not doubt the paternity of any of them. Okay, my mother always told me one thing. I use Hokkien wa, kia boisai wa sen because ah uh, you 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 have children with someone. All right, I'm telling you, you may pretend that that child is yours, but people can tell. All right, that <laughs> people take one look and they know the paternity of the child. All right. <laughs> anyway, like Lipton said, uh, they all look alike and they all look like husband. Uh. They don't look like you at all. Uh. They look alike, you can just stop there. You don't need to add the sentence behind it. What is that, what is that English expression? Uh, they are so alike like that acorn seed or something like that. Yeah, I mean, you know? <laughs> oh, uh, anyway. Uh, okay, Anwiwi, anyway, I understand that um, about 10 years ago, you were the first and the last Singaporean to be threatened by a government agency to be sued for defamation. Can you tell us something about that? So there was, I was a student blogger back then. And then I was just complaining about the whole system. Why must I study? And not, and not only that. So my class, because I'm under the language elective program. So all my classmates, in fact in my entire class that I wrote inside my blog, there is only one person who is a Singaporean who is born in Singapore in my entire class, and I and huh? I. Did you just say the whole class? You're the only you were only Singaporean. Yeah. So I blocked okay. about it. What was the name of your school? <laughs> it has it has merged with Pioneer or JC. Oh, it's that one I closed down. Okay. Jurong Pioneer <laughs> JC now. So that was how my blog started because I felt it was very unfair. It's like my 
my whole class, everybody is older than me. And I, and I feel like that puts me in a disadvantage. Yeah, because when they come, they are like two years, three years, there are some even five years older than me. Then like, you're half a decade older than me. If I have five years head start, then I would have done so many things differently already. That was how my blog started. And then I, I start, after that, I started complaining. I go to the workforce. Then I got my first paycheck. And I was like, the boss, the boss actually uh, cheat my pay by 50 cents. <laughs> so I was supposed to get $5.50 per hour in my first job. But the boss only gave me $5. So he said, oh, you don't have a full-time contract. And I was like, yeah, because when we sign up, it's part-time. You say $5.50. Yeah. Then I was like, okay. So I felt unhappy and I write my blog. And then I'm like, when I get my paycheck, you, you need to do that compulsory donation. Yeah. So I do the compulsory donation. I was like, huh? Another 50 cent, one dollar gone? Then, then after that, I was like, okay, never mind. Then I continue calculating. How come it's still lesser? Oh, because I must give to CPF. Then I also complained about it on my blog. I was like, then I started counting. Okay, if I'm going to continue working like this, then how long am I going to take to get my first house? Then I settled, okay, this doesn't work. I cannot continue working like this. Yeah, so in order to fulfill my dream of getting a house at 21 and then have my four kids by 30 years old, I need a different kind of financial scheme. Yeah, financial planning for myself. So that was how I tried to, you know, protect my children. Yeah. And I, I wrote inside my book that it was not easy for me to get pregnant. Because in Singapore, there's a very high level of stress. So a lot, a lot of people suffer from for, for infertility issues in Singapore. And a lot of people, after they give birth to their first child, because of how the hospital all this do all kinds of weird things to you when you're giving birth. Yeah, like for example, when I was giving birth, they tried to operate and cut on me. When I was giving birth naturally, everything was natural. But they just want to come and insert weird medicine and then try and cut me every day. And I was like, no, no such things to my body. Yeah. So because of this kind of injury that happened to mothers in Singapore, a lot of them also cannot give birth later on. Yeah. And if you go to KK Hospital, uh, there's a very big banner over there, which is about five voice. A lot of women in Singapore have this issue. So some of them have to remove their en entire womb. And all this kind of health issue comes in because they have stress problems. So when I first tried out to have kids with my husband, we didn't succeed. So our BTO is not the first attempt. We actually failed. Yeah, before we get our final house. And when we tried to have kids, we also didn't succeed immediately. We actually failed. Then after that, we managed to get pregnant. Then when we got pregnant, we were like, okay, just because we can get pregnant doesn't mean you can carry the baby to full term. Because there are a lot of miscarriages in Singapore as well. So these are all the issues that we are very scared of. So Hanui, from what you have just told us, you were already fighting for justice when you were a teenager. Is that why you named your first son Justice? Yes. Okay. And another thing is because I know it's very hard to find justice in Singapore. So maybe I can try to keep justice on my side. But now that I have three kids, right? Then I'm very scared, you know? Because a lot of people say, I'm not Lee Kuan Yew. And I'm like, okay, better hope I'm not Lee Kuan Yew. Because you see Lee Kuan Yew's three children like this, he want to come out of the grave, also cannot, you know? <laughs> I will be very sad if my children end up like Lee Kuan Yew's children. Okay, so at the end of the day, uh, about 10 years ago, when you were like, maybe about like 21 or so, a government agency threatened to sue you for defamation. So in the end, what happened? In the end, the whole statutory board shut down. And the AGC was involved again. <laughs> so it was like 10 years ago, they've been sending me letters. And 10 years later, right after I gave birth, they sent me letters. And when you, when you have just given birth, you will have those hormones issues. Yeah, because all mothers have it. It's just whether yours is baby blue or yours is postpartum depression. Whether it gets serious or not serious. So the moment I receive it, I was like, huh? And, I, and my baby is breastfeeding every hour. So I cannot sleep at all. I haven't been sleeping for a long time. All my three children are breastfeeding. So I haven't been sleeping for a long time. So I just made a video. I made like 50 videos. Which have been scheduled to auto post by itself. Even if I'm not using my phone. Yeah. Oh, so you say you're very putting lah. Every hour going to feed the baby, <laughs> then you got to worry about how uh, whether can get uh you know the twenty two thousand to pay the agency. Yeah, and how to bring my baby to court. <laughs> how uh, to bring three children to court. Okay, I think now we need the lawyer's uh, uh, comment. Uh. Uh, Lim Tian, can a government agency sue a citizen for defamation? 
You see, uh, there is a principle in law, in uh, English law and Singapore law, which is similar in this regard, that governments cannot sue for defamation. It is known as the Derbyshire Principle after a very famous case known as Derbyshire. And this was a case decided by the UK's highest court at that time, what we used to call the House of Lords. The House of Lords is of course one part of Parliament, right? But in the old days, it also functioned as the highest court of the land. They have done away with the House of Lords being a court now. Now they have what is known as a Supreme Court. But that is of quite a uh, 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 recent happening. When I was a student in England, the House of Lords was still the highest court in the land. And so these days, when, I, when you talk to me about the Supreme Court, it is still you know, unusual for me to hear that term. But what the House of Lords said in the Derbyshire case was this. A government has no right to sue for defamation because in a democracy, the government's duty is to explain, explain to the citizens its position. All right? You cannot say, oh, you have said something bad about me, so I'm going to sue you for defamation. You have no such right as a government or as a government agency. Okay? That is my view. And of course, it leads me to one of the pet subjects of Singaporeans in recent years, POFMA. Yeah? You see ministers issuing POFMAs left, right and center. You know, like, you know what? They are treating themselves as God, treating themselves as the arbiters of truth. What right do they have? You, you ask yourself, especially, you know, what put it in very stark contrast was the recent pofmas against Yo Lam Tiong, the former chief economist of the GIC, who commented on the HDB, all right, and then subsequently on other social policies as well. Now, in a democracy, people have differing opinions and views. You know, for Lawrence Wong, for Desmond Lee to come up with pofma just smacks of arrogance. Yeah, arrogance. Arrogance borne out by the fact that this is a government that has a super majority in parliament. Thinks it can do whatever it wants. I say this without any cons. POFMA is the most stupid and useless, useless law ever created by any parliament in the world. Yeah. I have represented people who were POFMA. People like the online citizen. You know, over one incident in Yishun, over the old lady. All right? Um, uh, a passerby noted down what happened, posted on his Instagram post, and TOC reposted. TOC got pothmarked. Now, why are you pothmarking that? A concerned Singaporean has noted down what in his observation happened, all right? But no, this is the law of the land. And then, you know, when the law was going through committee or parliament, the law minister said, oh, don't worry. Differences can be resolved very quickly by the courts. And the time frame given or indicated was like nine days. You should have your, your, your dispute resolved. And it will not be costly. I can tell you, the dispute between TOC and the minister who pofmarked him, who was also the minister for home affairs, lasted well over. I, I, I took the matter over in the later stages, all right? But I'm telling you, it lasted for well over a year. There was another pofmark case involving the SDP, the Singapore Democratic Party, and TOC again. And you know, the Court of Appeal, Court of Appeal, the highest court in the land, took about one and a half years, one and a half years, to deliver judgment. So you tell me that this is a fast process? It is ridiculous. 
when people are having trying to have their differences resolved to have to go through the layers of court all right maybe hire lawyers do you think singaporeans have that type of money have that type of uh, time to, to go through that process so my friends defamation in our country has stood still since 1952 when the defamation act was brought into law it was a carbon copy of the old english act all right in fact a lot of our laws are borrowed from the english the british who were the former colonial masters do you know that in that span of time the british have revise their defamation law two or three times the latest being in 2013 and these days you cannot just sue a person for defamation in england or britain unless unless you can show the court that serious harm was done to your reputation all right in singapore the test is different once you show the offending words, the court doesn't need evidence of damage. All right? If it reads the words and it thinks that, yes, it is defamatory, damage is presumed. No longer in Britain. But we have not advanced. We have not advanced as a country. Our laws have not advanced. We proudly boast to the world we are a first world nation, and yet our laws have not kept, all right, in touch with modernity and what a modern society expects. And the old law, I'm telling you, is very good for authorities, isn't it? All right? For people who, who love to sue for defamation, right? Yeah? but it does not pre promote free speech it does not promote a creative society and this is what i feel very sad about singapore you know i i don't hold back in what i discuss in public all right because i feel it's my right maybe i have the added advantage in that i'm a lawyer as well so I do know the boundaries between what is defamation and what is not. But so often when I speak to my friends in a public place, like say in a coffee shop, they'll be like whispering to me, oh, this, and then they'll be looking around them, you know, as if, you know, to, to, to see whether there's someone around them who may listen in. All right? People are so scared. So there's this fear mentality that pervades our society. And when you have this fear mentality, you cannot be a creative society. So, who's to blame? The PAP. All right? You want to say Singaporeans are not creative? It is because of what you have done to our society for the last 60 years. Yeah? If I'm in government one day, the first thing I do, I get rid of the useless Hoffman. I get rid of Fika and I will update our defamation laws. Yes, there is a place for defamation laws, but not the draconian laws which currently are still in place in our country. Now, Han Yu Wee, let me tell you, talk about POFMA. I understand that during the POFMA committee hearings in Parliament, you were physically carried out or thrown out of Parliament. Can you tell us something about that? I happen to have a stack of paper Happened to his wife, book cover is there. And then I'm not sure why all the camera looking at that piece of paper. Because I was holding it in front of my body. Yeah. But it's but in the news they say that I held it up. Yeah, they say that I hold up a piece of paper to protest in the parliament. The thing is, if I want people to look at me, I don't need to hold up anything. I just hold it in front of me, people look at me really. And why are they looking at me? And why are they looking at that piece of paper? And why is that piece of paper a sign of protest? Why is he so sensitive about it? Because in his interview when people ask him about it, do you read that book? He said he got no time to read the book. 
You know why he got no time to read the book? Because he's busy reading other people's Facebook in order to pop my damn. Okay, I think uh, <laughs> we better not uh, <laughs> talk some more about your. Uh, but understand that. And, and another thing is, I was I haven't given birth at the time. I was still a virgin. So I was 33 kg, you know. Every time I give birth to each child, I gain 1 kilo. Yeah. So now you are 36 kilo after 3 kilo. Ah, yeah, correct. I'm 36 kilo right now. Yeah. So but the, the fact yes. is that I understand that three security actually carried you out of, of, out of parliament now. Actually, it was more than that in the photo. And I don't understand why so many people must touch me to ask me to get out. I already gave them 33 everything. kilo, you need three person to carry you out. Mm -hmm. Were you struggling or I know, screaming, shouting? I never scream, never shout. You know, I'm a peaceful person. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, Lim Tian. Uh, you know, since today the the main focus is about helping to crowdfund to pay uh, the Wiwi and the six ridiculous 22,000 cost to the AGC, let me just move back a bit to the judicial review. Yesterday, in the daily update of the Ministry of Health website, okay, the seven-day moving average of people in ICU was per 100,000 population was zero for no minimum protection. No minimum protection means not fully vaccinated. Otherwise, formally, you know, known in the website as uh, you know, non fully uh, non fully vaccinated. What is very surprising is that the number for up to date vaccination, meaning those who already have a booster, you know, to meet the requirement to be you know vaccinated up to date, is zero point one two per one hundred thousand population. What? I mean, did you argue this in your judicial review? We did. In fact, we showed the figures that according to our calculations, the number of deaths, number of, and, and don't forget, yeah, the government's narrative had always been vaccination will prevent serious illnesses and deaths. All right. Serious illnesses, I take it to mean people in ICU. All right. And you know when Hui Hui and the five others launched the application, in Hui Hui's affidavit, we showed the figure, and we used MOH's own numbers, which they published on their website every day. All right. That. The ratio was staggering. Number of deaths, the ratio was 4.7 to 1. That means the number of people dying, having been fully vaccinated, was 4.7 times that of unvaccinated. Right? Well, of course, MOH had their own data, whatever. The court didn't accept our arguments, okay? And not only that, when it came to another set of figures, I think this was, I think this was serious illness, was it? I think it, I think it was ICU, all right? The figures were equally started. If I remember correctly, now my, my memory may not be correct, right? I, I, I beg your, uh, your pardon for it. I think it was 28 to 4 or something like that. That was the ratio. So again, the number of people in ICU being fully vaccinated was a lot more than people who were not vaccinated to the standard required to be considered fully vaccinated, all right? So, when I saw those figures, it was clear as daylight to me. <laughs> How can you argue? How can you argue that the unvaxxed are actually 
a danger to society. Now, I used to be a lot more on the ball, as you would put it, as far as this vaccine story was concerned, as far as the data and all that was concerned. I'm not so on the ball on it at the moment. But I believe that so many other countries now have relaxed the requirements totally. I understand now for England, for Britain, you do not need to be vaccinated to go in. All right? So long as you can show that you are negative, COVID negative, they allow you in. They don't care whether you're vaccinated or not. Yeah? All right? So, you know, I, I, I think there is no point in, 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 in pretending. I mean, you, you, you have all these restrictions, and then when the wave comes, you know, you climb down again, it will start and go, it killed off so many businesses. All right? Killed off so many businesses. And I feel very, very sorry for those people who stood up to their principles, who refused to be vaccinated like Han Hui Hui, and who lost their jobs as a result. I'm not saying that Hui Hui lost the job, but Hui Hui also uh, was in fear of being prejudiced because her argument was this. If I want to apply for a job, I won't get it. Because which employer will want to employ someone who is unvaccinated because of what the government said they could do? All right? And on that note, which employer will want to employ, as I understand it, and we be, that you're the first and last person in the history of Singapore to have been charged and found guilty for conducting an illegal protest in the only place where you can legally protest in Singapore. You want to tell us about this strange story? So on 27 September 2014, I can remember the date very clearly now. Because it's that day. Yeah, it's very, very meaningful to me. And then that was the day I realized that in Singapore you don't really have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Because the reason why I went to Hong Lim Park Speaker's Corner was because I went to speak up on how the first speech was because of the defamation suit on how there is no freedom of speech in Singapore. And by being charged, immediately they say that I can no longer hold public assembly. But I don't understand why they are afraid of us holding public assembly if there is nobody supporting us and nobody agreeing with us. So the government always say, okay, you know, they are a crazy bunch of people, nobody will agree with them, don't go and listen to them. So yes, if the government is already having such a big machinery over there, say that asking people not to support us, then why are they still thinking that people will support us? So there must be something that is wrong in between. It's like, why do people want to watch our videos if they think that our video is not true? I mean, there are so many videos online every single day. There are so many people going to parliamentary hearing. So why don't the government go and look at every single one of them? Hey, your shirt got some issue. Hey, your shirt, your button arrow button properly. Those kind of things they don't want to look. But they want to look at people who are holding a piece of paper. And then they want to go and charge people who are holding protests in Singapore. And that case was... The case actually went all the way to the United Nations. So the United Nations Human Rights Committee wrote into the Singapore government. And because the UN is involved and the Singapore is a member of the UN, the Singapore government had no choice, but they have to actually reply to the UN. <coughs> and the Singapore government reply was that there are hundreds of protests in Singapore. Do you really hear hundreds of protests in Singapore? The answer is no. So what happened is NPAPS got this particular website. And what the government says is that there are a lot of people who applied and all these people got approval and therefore Singapore is democratic and we allow people to hold public assembly except for just us. And at that point in time, it was in 2014 and I had to raise funds on behalf of two other Singaporeans. This same round, they want me to raise funds on behalf of five other Singaporeans. So back then, they claimed that I was a leader and everyone was listening to me. So I say much, they were much. If everybody was listening to me, I told, I don't, I don't need, you know, 6,000 people or 6 people to be charged with me, fundraise for 6 people. What I need is just 6 government policies to change, you know, for our housing, for our healthcare, for our CPF, for our retirement, for our transportation, our education, just, and national service. So 6 of that, housing, healthcare, CPF education, 
retail, uh, education, military, and transportation. These are the six policies that I think are the most important that affect Singaporeans life. And I feel that the government should change these six policies first. Yeah. Let me chime in on CPF. You know, CPF, return CPF at 55 is one of the irrevocable principles of the political party I need, the people's voice, all right? I was in a taxi this morning, and the taxi driver actually made a very good point. Because the excuse the government gave for not allow or, or changing its policy of CPF at 55 was that men were taking their monies to go to Batam, have mistresses there and squandering their money, right? No, we, we need to clarify this point. Not every man will have two wives, like the Prime Minister or the Law Minister. Most men in Singapore can't even get one wife. <laughs> now, and the driver said, but how can that apply to a woman? But the woman also cannot withdraw the CPF at 55, right? <laughs> and I said, well, that's a good point. So, you know, women are not going to go to Batam to find, uh, what, gigolos or whatever, all right, or, yeah, or a male partner, yeah, so... No, this, this part we also must clarify, okay? Not all women will lose their money in FTX. <laughs> not all women are the Prime Minister wives. <laughs> so not all men will have two wives like the Prime Minister. And not all women will lose money like the Prime Minister wife. We need to get this clear first. And it's very, very rare to have a young uh, mother like you have three children in uh, uh, you know, uh, four years. Now, what was the name of this famous protest in 2014, you know, for, for which you were charged and found guilty of conducting uh, illegal protests in the only place where you can legally protest? It was called Return Out CPF. Wow, so, okay. it, a lot of people think that, okay, we just want back all our CPF money. But it's not wanting back all our CPF money also. Because if you just take back your CPF money now, how much money you have inside? How much interest is the government giving? So when we say that, okay, FTX is losing money, the IB is the internet brigade, their first response is, oh, you know, just because the FTX is losing money, actually the Marseille GIC is earning a lot of interest, a lot of profit, very, very uh, high rate of returns, okay? So the thing is, if let's say they are generating such a high rate of return, and according to all other countries in this world, all other countries, they will give this return back to the people. And like Lee Kuan Yew's era, our CPF interest rate was 6.5%. So why did it drop to 2.5%? So this is the issue over there. We need to get back our CPF returns as well. If I put in $10,000, the, the AGC wants $20,000. If I have $20,000 inside my CPF, at a rate of 2.5%, 30 years later, what is the amount? At a rate of 6.5%, 30 years, 20 years later, what is the amount? So this is a very big difference and because it is compounded over the years. So if let's say we if let's say we have a 6.5% interest, we can actually pay off our houses early, we can retire early. But it's because they give only 2.5% and the rest they say admin cost or whatever, they keep it in their own, you know, to lose in FTX. Then these are the issues that we Singaporeans should raise. And these are the returns that they should return to us as well. Because if you return me my CPF money now, then what about my returns that have been inside for a long period of time? You see, at the current interest rate, I mean, when inflation has gone up so much, interest rates have gone up so much, right? What's the interest rate today? Easily 3.5 to 4 for a property loan. So if your money is sitting in CPF earning 2.5%, Actually, you're losing money every year, aren't you? Your money is, you know, losing its value, right? Now, why have they not increased the CPF rate? We should be asking that, correct? Why is it that in Malaysia, they can get 6% returns on their EPF? And why in Singapore, after so many years, are we stuck at 25 And we know, and we know, and NAS have finally come up to admit it, all right? In... in Interest rates, inflation will remain high. All right, they say well, it will it will moderate next year, but everyone knows inflation is going to remain high, and I have been saying this throughout this year. And when Lawrence Wong said, "Oh, it will moderate and all that," I laugh. Okay, I'm telling you, 
you go into next year and you see the inflation that is going to rage in Singapore, exacerbated by a 1% increase in GST on the 1st of January, which is two weeks away. Yeah? I think there, there are a lot of news now. A lot of people have to buy their they are moving house, collecting video kits. Then they say a lot of people just pay the money now because they cannot afford to pay the extra 1% next year. And not only that, I think for 2 out of 5, 40% of Singaporeans cannot afford to pay their mortgages as well. I have met so many young Singaporeans, young Singapore families. You know what they are having to do? They have to travel to JB to buy milk powder. Can you believe it? Yeah? Milk powder has become a big issue. And buying it in JB is like so much cheaper than in Singapore. So seriously, next year, you're going to talk about high inflation, high interest rates. You're going to talk about a serious problem of food as well. Yeah. Now, Han Yu in your famous to return our CPF uh, illegal protests when the trial started, I understand you had no lawyer, no legal representation, right? So you went to court without a lawyer, right? Okay. Now, Lim Tian, uh, it's well known that you have uh, done many, many uh, pro bono cases, you know. So why do you do so many pro bono cases? Oh, well, you know, I didn't feel, I didn't think I had a choice because, you know, when people turn to me, I mean, I had to help. I mean, if I was in practice at that time when Han Hui Hui was charged, I would have defended her pro bono. No, no question asked. I recently defended Gilbert Go pro bono for a uh, public assembly offense as well. You know? And, um, yeah. So, um, that, that is it. It is difficult because it doesn't pay your bills. But if uh, people like me don't do it, who will do it? then people are without representation. And I abide, I abide by this principle which was imbued in me when I was training to be a barrister at law in, in England, that no matter how poor or how rich a person is, that person is entitled to legal representation. And you know, in England, they still have this rule, although it is not strictly uh, abided by these days. In fact, a lot of the top lawyers don't abide by it. But they have known as they have what is known as a cap rank rule. That means, as a barrister or an advocate, you are not supposed to choose your cases. Whatever case comes to you, if you are available, you should take it. Now that may be a hopeless case, but. If you are true to your calling, you should take that case. And many people say, oh, he's a murderer. How could you have defended him? I never take part in those debates. You know why? It is not about whether it is right or wrong. A person is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. All right? And so when Han Bibi said earlier that once she had been charged, she could not hold any more public assembly, I say, what rubbish? That is wrong. Because until you're convicted and proven guilty, you're presumed to be innocent. Why can't you? Now, Han Wee you... A lot of people say you are perpetual pain in the... <laughs> you know, right? Yeah? Because I understand, you're also the first and probably the only Singaporean ever to be deported from Malaysia, denied entry into Kuala Lumpur Airport when you flew from Singapore at the request of a foreign government. You want to tell us about the episode? That is why my baby are breastfed. Because I cannot go and buy milk powder back into Singapore. Which a lot of mothers are actually doing. <laughs> but the thing is, a lot of people are doing that in Singapore. Which is a very sad thing. And why is it that people are not buying milk powder in Singapore? Because 8% GST soon. So they have no choice, they have to go up to buy their milk powder, diapers, petrol. So that inside the mother's group, which is why I actually managed to know about their mothers who suffer in KK hospital when they were giving birth, and babies who are born the same year, newborn like my baby, who just become deaf forever for the rest of their life. If this happened to my baby, I won't be sitting here already. It's, the reason why I'm sitting here is because I need to fundraise this. The A 
AGC claim that there are videos made about me, so I must fundraise, then I must put this bank account, you know? So the reason why I'm here today is because of the AGC. But if let's say, if the KK Hospital did what they did to me, to my baby, like other people's baby whereby they suffer miscarriage, children have to sleep at, ho at the corridor in the hospital, then I won't be sitting here already. I'll be sitting outside KKH and I'll be filming there. So about legal representation, there is this thing that the law minister said is that because if people in Nishun GRC voted for him, he will make sure that people have legal representation when, when they go to court, which is what I wrote into the law minister since I'm his president now. So I wrote in, <laughs> I want to ask, okay, are you going to provide me with any legal assistance or anything? Dead silence. <laughs> this is as, I think he never read my email, just like he never read his first wife book. <laughs> huh. okay, this has been an issue. Well, okay. About were, the deportation, about the deportation yeah, okay. now. No, you were flying from Singapore to Malaysia, KL, KL and then the you were right reported the request of, of, of for Singapore the government. government, right? Now, what were you supposed, what were you going to Malaysia to do at that time? You know, what were you supposed to, what were you doing there? I think at that time, people were curious. Is there a horrible dictator who died in Singapore? Then they were also curious. After he died, what's going to happen to his house? Is it going to be demolished or not? So this was the question they were supposed to debate and talk about. No, no, what were you supposed to do in Malaysia? Uh, you were supposed to speak to... at conference or what? Yeah, correct. Tian Anmen, uh, uh, June 4th... Uh, no, 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 I was supposed to attend human rights workshop. It was oh, a human rights workshop. workshop. Okay. Yeah. So you were flying from Singapore to KL to speak at a human rights workshop. Yes. And then you were deported. And it was to speak three. about Singapore. Ah, of course. Yeah, because you... I'm a Singaporean. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh. So for oh. all the IVs down Lim there, they okay. should they should petition to let me enter Malaysia to talk at workshop again. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now Lim Tian, you also cannot go to JB to buy milk powder, right? <laughs> me? Ah. Can you enter JB? Not at the moment. Uh, why? Because my passport has been impounded. Oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because of all the charges they levied against me. So, yeah, I got to seek permission if I want to travel. I can't enter one country. He can't even leave the country. <laughs> so we are all stuck here. <laughs> Thanks to the AGC. If not because of the AGC, we wouldn't be here making the videos. But anyway, I mean, uh, I'm not complaining, you know, I'm perfectly happy staying in Singapore. Yeah, and um, yeah, so I think sometimes it's good to stay put in your own country for an extended period and then you really observe what is going on. I used to travel a lot, you know, I used to be out of Singapore most of the time. But um, I will say that the last few years, ever since the advent of COVID, has been very instructive because then you really can feel the flow of the country. All right. And that has helped me immensely in politics, which I am very interested in. And I have no intention of ever giving up, no matter how many charges I face. All right. And... Um, you know that this is a long process. It, it may take a while for us to bring change about in Singapore. Mm. But you know, try as they may, change will come. All right? Just like the famous story of the romance of the three kingdoms. Empires rise and fall, wax and wane. Okay? All political regimes change it is just a matter of time and there was a very famous British Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli who once said change is constant in a progressive country there must be change so yes I'm happy watching the events unfold and I'm happily sitting in Singapore waiting for change to happen. <coughs> now, Hanwee Wee. Well, my uh, son need to serve NS. My son's surname is Tan. You know? Now that, Hui Hui, I'm sorry to stop you. 
I think you have posed what, to me, is going to be a critical <coughs> issue in the coming years. All right? You know something? I served two and a half years in the Singapore Army. All right? At that time, <coughs> if you were an officer, you were required to serve two and a half years. I had reservist obligations until I was 50. On my 50th birthday, I received a letter from MINDEF to say I was no longer liable for reservist duties. Now, today, NS has been cut down to, I think, 20 months. Yeah? I, think, I think that is right. But you know what is the more critical issue? The more critical issue is why are new citizens who are 30 years and above exempted from NS? I think that is very unfair. That is very unfair. And you know, in here and in Parliament says, oh, it's because young Singaporeans had the benefit of our system as, and so they must repay their obligation. What a stupid argument, honestly. You know, that foreigner who becomes a new citizen of this country is taking advantage of a system that was built up by indigenous Singaporeans. Why can a 30-year-old new citizen not be trained as a firefighter and have fought that fire in Tanjong Paga a week ago? Right? There's absolutely no reason, right? Instead, a native Singaporean, age 19, I believe, all right, fought the fire, died. Now, I ask you, is that fair? Are you telling me that once a new citizen hits 30, he's no longer fit to be in the army? Then why is it that native Singaporeans have reserved his obligations until 50 during my time? I do not know that may have changed now. It may have shortened to 40, 45. I have not kept in touch. But Lawrence Wong wants to talk about the social contract. Yeah? He wants to talk about a lot of things which are completely irrelevant. He bypasses the main issues. But I ask you to ask one question. You know, when you talk about the social contract, it is your relationship, it is your contract between you as an individual and the government, the state. Don't tell me about other things, all right? I want you to answer me on a fundamental question. Why is it that Singaporeans above 30 have reservist obligations, but new citizens above 30 do not have any NS obligations? Actually, that's, that's another thing. A lot of people like to say I'm a new citizen. So according to the government policy, to become a new citizen, to become a Singaporean, you need to earn a certain amount of income, you need to have certain qualifications. So I leave those comments there because it just means that I fulfill those qualifications. And in order to add on to why these 30 years and above they don't need to serve NSD is an issue is because if you are saying that these people above 30 years old cannot contribute and cannot serve NS to our country then these people shouldn't be given the citizenship I'm because telling they, you, they I'm telling you why contribute. they make this policy They know that if they insist on the new citizens above 30 doing NS no one will become a new citizen or those above 30 won't want to become a new citizen it's as simple as that, all right? But if you make that policy, ask yourself then, is it fair to that native Singaporean? And the answer is totally unfair. Because why? That native Singaporean, having had to do NS, has lost out two years at least. He had, he's going to lose out in terms of job opportunities. Why is it that many employers want to employ foreigners? Because they don't have reserve obligations, right? Han Weiwei, you have to pay $22,000 cost and disbursement to the AGC. What if you can't raise the money? What are you going to do? I will need to seek the law minister advice constantly. <laughs> <laughs> and we will continue making this video again. All the way, every single week. And I'll probably
probably make video every single day on how I have to go to different government agency and how it's like. So this year, I actually tried to go and seek pro bono legal survive, advice from the government because the government claim they provide pro bono legal advice. So there are a range of things that people have to go through. Then there are people who go to meet the people session and a lot of them are actually Okay, so in Singapore, we have this literacy rate of 99%, whereby a lot of people are educated in Singapore. But if you go to meet the people section, you can see that a lot of people are actually not educated in Singapore. They don't know how to fill out all these forms. So these are places that I can go. And for example, and, and to the AGC, because you postponed the 12 December event, the 12 December meeting at the court, <laughs> therefore I didn't go down to the MPS. But, that, but because I stayed in my estate and they publicized it into a big issue whereby we actually went to court because I'm going to move into my estate. So I went to court twice already because of that. But these are things that I didn't post. So I wanted to, I actually wanted to go to meet the people session. But I didn't go because the AGC postponed the date. So at the meet the people session the previous time, they see that the MP was not there. And they were, there was chaos over there as well. So the residents tell me this kind of news. And I think these are very good content that I can use since the AGC is the one giving me all this content to post. So there are a lot of issues in our estate, which the law minister himself posted on it. It's like they say issue is the so-called capital of Singapore. And in the capital of Singapore, there is this Melody Spring. Yeah, and in Melody Spring, the law minister mentioned that there is a person who purposely asked for a sheltered lingue. And the moment the law minister mentioned that there is a resident in Melody Spring asking for a sheltered lingway. Everybody in Melody Spring know which, which block this person stays in. Because the entire Melody Spring is like a whole estate and every single block is connected except for one block. Which is the block that the law minister is criticizing. That this particular block has a lot of crazy people. And to the extent that they went to the MPS, meet the people session and tried to harass the MP according to the law minister. But why do they call it harassment? People have problems and look for the MP. If you think that that is called harassment, it shouldn't be the MP in the first place. Which is also why he didn't attend meet the people session. That why do sense. MPs not attend meet the people session? I don't understand. You know, Singapore is such a small country. Alright? I mean, from the city to Yishun, if you go by the CTE, it doesn't even take you 20 minutes. Do you know that in England? Why does the British Parliament sit only Friday, Monday to Thursday? Because on Friday, all the MPs have to travel back to their constituency. Your constituency may be in Scotland, all right? You got to take the overnight train or whatever back to your Scottish constituency. And on a Friday, they meet their people. What they, they have a term for it. They call it surgery, all right? Okay? It's like, you know, you see a doctor and he performs a surgery. So, it's their surgery. But every Friday, the British MPs meet their citizens. Why is it I hear in Singapore, oh, MP not meeting uh, the citizens? And I hear that a lot about minister MPs. All right? All right? Uh, a lot of people complain to me, oh, my MP is this minister. Every time I want to go and see him, he's not there. And then his car kia attend to me. That doesn't give people a good impression. Alright? As an MP, no matter whether you are the PM or whatever, you should be meeting the people. Now Lim Tian, you graduated in law from Cambridge University in the UK. So uh, under the law, what actions can the AGC take against Han Wee Wee uh, if she's unable to raise the twenty two thousand dollars to Unfortunately they can do uh, uh, they can do various things. They can garnish her bank account, all right. So that means whatever money is in her bank accounts, they can garnish and seize that and take that to the tune of twenty two thousand. They can apply for bankruptcy against her because in Singapore, once you have a debt of more than fifteen thousand, they can come after you for bankruptcy. And I've known of several cases where people were bankrupted by the AGC for owing legal costs. All right? I represented an old lady, unfortunate, but in fact, the story, well, if you were her, had a nice ending. 
involved in a very bitter divorce with her husband that went on for years fighting over a $3 million property. For some reason, I was not her lawyer at that time. She has sued the AGC for various things. All right. And I think she owed costs of 30 over 1000 And I think the AGC bankrupted her. So it, it, it is serious, my friends. And um, that is why we are making this video. And that is why I'm appealing to you, especially to help Hui Hui and let her have this money to pay off the AGC. She did something incredibly brave when she took out that application. Not many people would have dared to have done that. But I think she has contributed to Singapore by doing that. And I can guarantee you, Hui Hui's application will be the first of many to come. Because this vaccine thing is going to engulf the world in the biggest scandal we have ever known. And I know that because I follow the news of what is happening in the European Parliament, happening in other Western countries. All right. And now, although I have no proof, I have no proof and I want to make that clear. But I will still refer to what happened in Thailand yesterday to that Thai princess, fully vaccinated. Why would a 44 year old collapse? all of a sudden and many other athletes who have done that as well all right so hui hui's application is a harbinger of things to come and i appeal to you again please help us to raise this fund for her actually there is this statistics that people did in countries that are most vaccinated then the countries that are most vaccinated actually have a decline in birth rate yeah so what happened is because they say that this vaccine, once injected into your body, your heart will beat very fast. Then because your heart beat very fast, all the blood pumps down below, the baby gets flushed away. So there are a lot of cases of this kind of things being reported in Singapore. But of course in Singapore, you know, we have a high cost of living and a very high standard of stress. Most mothers also don't need vaccine to get miscarriage. Most mo in fact, in Singapore, the miscarriage rate is also very high because of the age issue, whereby most mothers are about 30 years old and above. That is one thing. Then there's another thing is that in Singapore, because of the high cost of living, even without vaccine, without natural miscarriages, mothers choose to abort their children as well. So in a country whereby it has such a low birth rate, people claim that they are 40, 50 years old, they still don't have a single child because they focus on their career first. Then why is the government not protecting all these children, all these teenage pregnancy? Because there's a gap. It's like there are a lot of teenage pregnancy, young parents, shotgun, that kind of thing. Then it goes all the way down to the prime age where a woman can give birth about 35. So at this age, the number of pregnancy and birth goes down. Then it goes up again at 30 years old. So this is how mother, the age of mothers in Singapore. And there's this trend. So why don't we protect the mothers who are around their early 20s and let them have their children then give birth to the next generation because if these mothers go for abortion as well then there is also another issue is that they will suffer from secondary infertility then that also explain why Singapore have a low birth rate because once they abort the children they cannot have their next child as well Now Anivi, you are one of the six joint litigants in the judicial review, right? Do you know if the AGC is chasing the other five to pay the Twenty two thousand or so? No. Because this is political persecution. So when something is political persecution, they have just one target. And everybody knows it. So when will this political persecution stop? Because in 2013, it was AGC getting involved because a statutory board tried to use taxpayers' money to sue me for defamation. In 2014, I was being charged all the way to 2016. The trial lasted for about two years. Then in 2017, that was when I was threatened again by the AGC. And every time the AGC sent a letter, I'm not the person who signed the letter. That's also another issue. Yeah, and this time round, the person who has been signing the letter got so fed up, the person did something which I'm not going to say, and then it ended up that the AGC declared that they cannot find me in the whole of Singapore. 
when I'm sitting in Yishun, in the mm -hmm. law minister mm -hmm. walk every single day. Because mm -hmm. I have a baby, I, I can't possibly just leave the house. I have three babies to take care of, with the other two running about. Then, that lasted in 2017. So in 2017, they wanted me to basically stop posting everything online. And I did. I actually stopped posting everything online. So when I stopped posting, that is when they said, Oh, you know, she has done... Uh, she, some, some of them say I went to jail. Some of them say I sit asylum. Some of them say whatever. They just, they just continue saying all kinds of things about me. Yeah. But until today, I haven't seen the CCTV of me. Yes. They claim that they saw the CCTV, but we are not sure whether it's a guy or a girl who saw the CCTV. That's one issue. I understand you are also uh, the first person to be threatened to be charged under the contempt of court act then uh, because of six posts you made and you were threatened with if I remember uh, $600,000 fine and 18 years jail can you tell us something about that? I'm not sure whether it's six posts or how many posts but when it's political persecution it doesn't matter it's one post, six posts or 60 posts they will just use something against you and they will just threaten to they threaten to jail me for 18 years and they threaten me with a six hundred thousand dollars fine but the thing is they didn't send the letter to me instead they harassed my family members and tell my family members to say you better ask her to stop if she doesn't stop i will take her away and because my family members were scared at that point in time i was like okay fine i will listen to you but now if you take me away she has no breast milk she's drinking almost all the time so if you if you are going to take and i and this time around i make a lot of videos when i received the letter the moment i received the letter as compared to last time, back then, if you ask me to stop, I will stop. Because my main issue is, I need to make sure people don't get scared. But now if you ask me to stop, I will not stop. I will continue making video because I don't want my children to be scared. If I don't make video, I suddenly just disappear. Then my children will be... And if something happens to me, my children will be the one who suffer in the first place. Yeah. Especially I have a newborn. So the moment this thing happened, I was like, okay, I'm going to film a lot of video. And because I just keep uh, the hormones and everything, so, and I, and I don't need to sleep. So I just keep making videos throughout. I made, I think more than 50 videos every day. Yeah, <laughs> I just didn't post them. So I, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for the AGC. And, and there's another thing is that a lot of residents like to talk to me. So I also have a lot of things in the neighborhood where I can post. But I also haven't posted them. Yeah, I'm just waiting to see what the AGC is going to do to me. Then I can know what to do back to them. Yeah. So the condition not to charge you under the contempt of court act was only that you apologize and you did apologize, right? But a lot of people say they cannot find my apology. Hey, you're not answering the question. Do you apologize <laughs> or not? Do the AGC la. didn't answer my question also. The law minister never answered my question. Okay. It, okay, it's not meaningful to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Lim Tian, uh, you know, under the law, if there are six litigants in a judicial review, uh, can they just chase one or is it, or they must chase all six or how does you it see, work? see, I mean the six litigants were all jointly and severally liable for the cause. That means, yes, they can choose to go after one only. Alright, and here from what I understand, they have chosen to go after Han Hui Hui. Now, I do not know, you see Han Hui Hui was number one applicant. Her name was at the top, alright, followed by five others. Would they have done the same if Han Hui Hui's name was number six and not on the top? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> you know, I don't know. But yes, they can do that. But you wonder why, right? You wonder why. So, but we we have this issue at hand now, so i rather address the issue. And uh, whether it is one or six, at the end of the day, the fund still has to be raised. And once again, my friends, without sounding like a broken record, I appeal to your generosity to help we, we solve this problem. Now, Han Wee Wee, you have had a very interesting, checkered and challenging life at the tender age of 31. You're 31 years old, right? Mm. Yeah, at 31, oh my god, you have been threatened uh, about 10 years ago 
uh, to by a government agency to sue you for defamation. Uh, uh, you are the first person to be charged and found guilty of conducting an illegal protest in the only place where you can legally protest in Singapore. Uh, you were physically thrown out of uh, you know uh, hearings uh, in Parliament. You were threatened uh, to be charged under the Contempt of Court Act unless you apologize. You know. And now, and then, oh, you were deported from Malaysia at the request of a foreign government. And now, you have this judicial review where uh, you, if you don't raise the $22,000, as Mr. Lim Chen explained, they can uh, make you a banker or something like that. Then cannot leave the country. Oh, uh, Lim Tian, you mean once bankrupt cannot leave the country? Yeah? You, once you are bankrupt, you need the approval of the okay. official assignee. To leave the country, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I think we had a long afternoon. I just have one more thing to ask of you, uh, Lim Tian. Uh, if there's one wish, you know, that you like to make, what will it be? I I like to see change in this country. Um, I think in this decade. Singaporeans will find out that you may have all these gleaming towers and apparent material success, but without freedom, you are not living life meaningfully. And it is not a meaningful society and country you live in. Han Wee, one wish, and don't tell me that uh you're going to have your fourth baby uh, by the end of this year or something. My wish is that I have children who don't need to worry if they speak, don't need to worry when they go out alone. Because a lot of people think that Singapore is a safe country and you can go out alone. But the thing is, if they go out alone and just like what I did, I happen to have a piece of paper in my hand and people say that my children started illegal protesting because it's illegal to protest as one person in Singapore, then my children get arrested. I don't want my children to have that fear. So I don't want... I'm not so much into any other thing. I don't want my children to be arrested, you see? So the first thing is, don't be scared when you talk. Don't be scared to go out. And then, if they go to hospital, they don't need to be scared that they will have to sleep at the corridor. That their health care will be protected. If they want to have sex, please don't anyhow do it at the staircase. Please go and do it inside <laughs> your house. So I want their housing their houses to be there. Yeah. And I want them to be able to see their grandchildren retire. So dear Singaporeans, thank you for watching the first ever live with Lim Tian and Han Wee Hui. If you like uh, what you have seen and heard, you know, please share this with your friends. Uh, you know, uh, make your comment, give us your feedback, uh, say something because your future and your children's future, as both we, we at Lim Tian have said, is in your hands. Thank you. Ah, and please, just, yeah. if I can add a final word, please help us to spread the word and get your friends to also donate to this cause. Thank you very much. If there's a first, there will be a second. So we'll <laughs> see you again. Bye-bye.